All right, let's go ahead and get started. I've started the recording. Um, so one of the reasons why we are doing these joint biology chemistry um, seminars, lecture, uh, lectures, is the fact that many of the problems that we face today um, involves multiple disciplines and in many cases, chemistry and biology. And so a person who is trying to solve these problems uh, would need to know some degree of biology as well as chemistry. Apart from that, you know, having the faculty and students from both departments come together in a kumbaya moment or whatever mm -hmm. is always a nice, it's always a nice thing as well. So without any further um, preliminary commentary, I will turn it over to my biology counterpart, Professor Marlene Murray, to introduce our speaker for today. Okay, good morning and thank you everyone for being here and attending our second uh, joint chemistry and biology lecture series, lecture for the fall semester. Uh, I will give a brief introduction uh, of Dr. Catherine White. Dr. Catherine A. White completed her PhD in chemistry at MIT with Alice Ting, where she used enzyme engineering and evolution strategies to develop new techniques in fluorescently labeled proteins inside living cells. Dr. White followed that work with an NIH postdoctoral fellowship in Diane Barber's lab at UC San Francisco, where she elucidated the molecular mechanisms of pH sensitive wild type and mutant proteins. In 2019, Dr. White started her lab at the University of Notre Dame, where her group integrates novel molecular tool development with hypothesis-driven research to answer fundamental questions about the molecular mechanisms driving pH-dependent cell behaviors and how those mechanisms can be exploited for more effective and safer cancer therapies. Dr. White has received many early career awards, including an NIH New Innovator Award and an NSF Career Award. So Dr. White's work spans both biology and chemistry, hence it's ideal for her to share her work with us and we look forward to learning from you, Dr. White. Great, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm very excited to talk to you all today about the work that my lab has been doing. So I always use kind of a general title for these things because I don't usually know until the week before what <laughs> our work will have led us to. But um, our lab is broadly interested in understanding the roles for increased intracellular pH dynamics in regulating proteins, pathways, and cell behaviors. And so on this uh, initial slide here, I'm showing a lot of microscopy images. We do a lot of time-lapse and single cell microscopy to measure pH using pH biosensors, <clears throat> which you can see in a spheroid of a cancer cell spheroid model here in the center, and then an activated cancer cell spheroid on the right-hand side where you can see these uh, distinct protrusions coming out from the center of the spheroid. So we do a lot of work kind of looking at pH dynamics during the process of cell transformation and during the progression of tumor in these tumor spheroid models. And we also try and find molecular targets of that. So molecular targets being the proteins that sense these pH dynamics and uh, tell us a little bit about the molecular mechanisms. Um, during the talk today, I'll be mostly talking about a story on the molecular scale uh, that has some applications to cell scale. But intracellular pH or PHI dynamics regulate a whole host of, of normal cell behaviors. Transient changes in intracellular pH on the order of 7.0 to 7.6 have been shown to be necessary or sufficient for diverse cell processes like cytoskeleton remodeling, cell adhesion and migration, and proliferation and differentiation. However, there are significant limitations in the field. 
For example, we really don't know what the molecular players are, the proteins and biomolecules that are sensing these very small changes in pH to confer the global pH sensitive cell behavior. So that's a significant question that my lab has been trying to address. Another issue is that prior work on the mechanistic role for pH in these cell behaviors has been performed under non-physiological culture conditions using non-specific modes to change intracellular pH and frequently lacks single cell resolution. So we know pH, um, when pH increases, cells on average proliferate uh, more quickly, they migrate more quickly. But for example, we don't know whether that's true at the single cell level. If you raise pH in a single cell, does that single cell now divide more rapidly or migrate more quickly? And so that's just kind of a little bit of background in terms of the normal cell biology, but our lab is also interested in understanding how dysregulated intracellular pH dynamics uh, drive diseases like cancer. And so uh, during cancer development in a normal tissue, normal epithelia cells form tight cell-cell contacts with one another, and intracellular pH is between 7.0 and 7.2. But as cells undergo uh, dysplasia and form a tumor, intracellular pH increases, and it can be as high as 7.6 or even higher in metastatic cancer models. And so again, we know that this increased PHI is small, it's only about 0.5 pH units, but it has profound effects on these cancer cell behaviors. It causes cancer cells to proliferate, uh, to metastasize, and to essentially avoid apoptosis or programmed cell death. <clears throat> and again, we have uh, in the field some limitations in terms of our observations of pH in this process as well. For example, we don't know whether increased PHI is a cause or a consequence of transformation. We simply know that it correlates with this disease progression. So a big question we have is what happens if we raise pH in an otherwise normal epithelial cell? Can we cause that cell to uh, take on tumorigenic characteristics? Can we cause that cell to behave like a cancer cell? Another issue that we don't know is what pathways or proteins are altered to drive these tumorigenic phenotypes in response to the increased PHI. If we can identify those pH sensitive nodes or pathways that are being modulated with pH in cancer, that might uh, allow us to have a potential therapeutic window for treating cancer. And so as kind of a broad overview, our lab works across biological scales to study these pH sensitive cell processes. We have projects at the molecular and macromolecular scale, understanding how protonation, protonation events affect single protein uh, function. And this can uh, be mediated, as I'll talk about later in my talk, this can be mediated by single histidine switches going from a protonated to a deprotonated form, altering protein structure and thus uh, potentially protein function. We also have projects that are studying more complex networks of ionizable residues that can confer pH dependent association of uh, either proteins, uh, two different proteins or within a single protein of two domains. And so I'll also talk about that a little bit more in my talk. Uh, additionally, we have work at the cellular scale, looking at whether we can develop tools, optogenetic tools that allow us to raise pH in single cells and study how that affects single cell biology. We have some recent papers on this. I'm not gonna be talking uh, much about that today. We also have work at the tissue scale, again, studying how increased pH might drive the formation of tumors or the initiation of tumor genesis in, in uh, normal epithelial models. And then finally, uh, we have some work at the um, uh, evolutionary scale, trying to understand whether increased pH might be a driver for um, uh, the conservation or selection of specific mutations in cancer. And so when we think about uh, molecular scale effects of pH, pH can certainly alter protein electrostatics. And protein electrostatics are important for all modes of, of biology. They're important for molecular recognition and enzyme, for example, recognizing its substrate. It's also important for protein-protein interactions. Now, hydrophobic interactions are important for the avidity of protein-protein interactions, but match charges across an interaction interface are really important for the specificity of binding in these types of um, binding interactions. And then finally, there's uh, the potential for pH and for uh, protein electrostatics 
to alter protein nucleic acid and protein membrane interactions. And we know that protein nucleic acid interactions are important for transcription, they're important for uh, accurate um, DNA repair. They're also important for potential regulation of mRNA um, in, in, um, in the regulation of, of protein expression. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about today signaling proteins that are regulated by protonation changes um, that affect their association with the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And so all of this is uh, kind of logically makes sense. If you change pro protein charge, you can change protein electrostatics, but just because a protein can titrate, doesn't necessarily mean it titrates in that very narrow physiological range between 7.0 and 7.6. So we call the specific subclass of proteins that have activities or ligand binding affinities that are regulated by these physiological changes in intracellular pH, we call these proteins pH sensors. So it's a small subset of the potential proteins that can titrate uh, in your body. And so uh, the uh, the focus of the talk today will be our work uh, in recent years identifying molecular mechanisms of pH sensitive proteins and some uh, various approaches that we've used to uh, isolate and identify the molecular mechanisms of pH dependent biology. Um, and so uh, a common thread that you'll see throughout the talk today is that histidine residues are key mediators of pH sensing. So histidine has a pK of about 6.5. It can potentially uh, uh, titrate between a protonated and a deprotonated form in the physiological range. And it's the only naturally occurring amino acid with a solution pK that's anywhere uh, near the physiological pH range. And so I'm gonna walk you through one example of how histidine residues function in conferring pH sensitive activity with a protein using a, a protein that is um, inherently, uh, its job is to recognize pH changes. So obviously this protein must be pH sensitive. And so for this pH sensing mechanism of the sodium proton exchanger, NHE1, we characterize this, I characterize this as a, as a postdoc. And so what we found is that this protein uh, uh, under normal conditions uh, functions to raise intracellular pH by exchanging an intracellular proton with an extracellular sodium and performing this electroneutral exchange. Now, this only happens at low intracellular pH when the cell is getting a cue that pH is too acidic, this protein becomes activated. And what we discovered is that the regulation of ion transport is regulated by this C-terminal tail, where at low pH, conserved histidines in the C-terminal tail uh, become more likely to be protonated. And that protonation increases the association of the C-terminal tail with the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, which is decorated with negatively charged um, phosphonositides. And so what we found is that at low pH, when these histidines are protonated, you have close association with the plasma membrane and high transport activity. And then as pH uh, increases through the action of this specific transporter, those histidines become deprotonated, their association with the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane decreases, and this allosterically turns off NHE1 activity. And so this was uh, a lot of work to identify this molecular mechanism, and uh, this was a protein that was for sure uh, responsible for changing in pH, uh, pH inside cells, so it must be pH sensitive in terms of its function. But what was surprising to us is that this, uh, this cluster of histidines conferred pH dependent allosteric as well as pH dependent cooperativity. All of these histidines must be present in order for this pH sensing mechanism to work appropriately. So this gave us an idea that protonation could actually be considered a key signaling or allosteric regulator of, of proteins inside the cells. In fact, protonation could potentially be considered as a post-translational modification, similar to protein phosphorylation or acetylation. Because this single, uh, these single titratable histidines were critical for the function of this proten protein. The difference between protonation and phosphorylation is that protonation isn't catalyzed by an enzyme and it's not detectable by antibodies. So it's quite difficult to study when you're trying to isolate molecular mechanism. 
particularly inside cells. But the benefit of protonation to cells is that it's diffusion limited. So this means that you can very quickly regulate protein function inside the cells through the modulation of intracellular pH. And so this led us to think more kind of broadly about how other pH sensitive proteins might be functioning inside cells. And the first story that I'll tell you about today is a story of another histidine switch. This um, histidine switch is found not in a wild type protein, but in a mutant protein, IDH1. And so we started this search from observation, from biology, and this protein isocitrate dehydrogenase 1 is a cytosolic enzyme that's involved in, oh, sorry, I just need to move this a little bit so that I can actually see my screen. Okay, yes, now I can see. Yeah, so the, the um, started our search from the observation and the biology. Isocitrate dehydrogenase 1 is a cytosolic enzyme. It's involved in redox metabolism. And uh, the wild type protein reversibly converts isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate in the cytoplasm. And you'll notice here I'm drawing this protein as a dimer. It's an obligate dimer for function. And it does this catalysis reversibly. So it oxidizes isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, but it can also reduce alpha ketoglutarate to isocitrate. And what we found is that a recurrent somatic mutation in this protein, arginine 132 histidine, is found in about 70% of gliomas. So it's a highly recurrent mutation. Seven out of 10 patients with glioma that present in the clinic have this mutation uh, in their cancer. And so what that might suggest is that this mutant is modulating or affecting the wild type uh, protein function. That's usually what happens with somatic mutations in cancer. They either turn off tumor suppressors or turn on oncogenes. But with this arginine 132 histidine mutation, it actually uh, catalyzes what's called a neomorphic reaction. Instead of modulating the wild type function of the protein, it actually catalyzes a new reaction where it takes alpha ketoglutarate and reduces it to form D2-hydroxyglutarate. And so what this uh, suggests is that this mutation is conferring a new function on the protein. And it also suggests that this uh, production of D2-hydroxyglutarate uh, is an oncometabolite. It's only produced in cells in high quantities in cells that have this mutation. So uh, physicians and clinicians have used 2-hydroxyglutarate as a potential way to um, identify, diagnose, and characterize patients with uh, gliomas because it's a, a biomarker for the cancer. And so what we found is that when we expressed either the wild type protein or the mutant protein in uh, these mouse fibroblast cell lines, 3T3s, in the parental cell line, there was virtually undetectable levels of this oncometabolite D2-hydroxyglutarate. When we overexpressed wild type, we were able to see measurable uh, amounts of this um, aberrant oncometabolite. This uh, wild type protein, when overexpressed, does catalyze this reaction at very low amounts. But you can see that it's pH insensitive. When we have the cells at low intracellular pH or the cells at high intracellular pH, there's no difference. But then when you can see when we express the mutant protein, that histidine, we can see this distinct pH dependent production of this oncometabolite with increased production at low intracellular pH. And so when we look at the kind of uh, catalysis of this protein, we said, okay, so this arginine to 132 histidine mutation is conferring a new uh, production of an oncometabolite. It's also conferring new pH sensitivity not seen with the wild type protein. And so when we look at the crystal structure, that arginine residue in the wild type is coordinating directly the alpha ketoglutarate or isocitrate substrate. And so we hypothesized that this was a simple reaction where when the arginine is mutated to a histidine at low pH, when the histidine is protonated, it's better able to coordinate the alpha ketoglutarate substrate so you get more production of the oncometabolite. Whereas at high pH, when it's deprotonated, it can't coordinate the substrate and thus you don't get production of uh, the, as much production of the oncometabolite. And so we expected when we purified the mutant uh, protein in E. coli 
and measured its activity in the test tube that we would observe pH dependent production of the 2-hydroxyglutarate, just like we saw in cells. But what we saw is that the in vitro activity with this purified protein was not pH sensitive. You can see there's virtually no difference in these catalysis curves with increased alpha ketoglutarate production and measurable activity of the mutant protein. There's no difference at low buffer pH versus high buffer pH. Again, this would be the buffer pH of normal cells and this would be the buffer pH of cancer cells. And so this kind of made us scratch our heads a little bit uh, and think about what the difference between protein in a test tube versus protein in the cells. What's, what's the difference between those two uh, cases? Well, what we did know from prior literature is that uh, these proteins form a homodimers where the wild type and uh, wild type forms a homodimer and the mutant forms a homodimer in this diagram, but you can also form heterodimer where the mutant protein forms a heterodimer with the wild type. And it was shown in a couple of cases that that was uh, the heterodimer formation produced more of the oncometabolite than the mutant protein alone. And so we realized that inside cells, we not only have the protein that we're forcing the cells to express, we also have a little bit of endogenous protein present. And so we <clears throat> hypothesized that it wasn't direct substrate binding in terms of its pH dependent mechanism, but instead the formation of the heterodimer was somehow favorable at high pH compared to low pH. And so while I told you that that arginine coordinates the substrate in the substrate bound form of the protein, that's true, but the arginine also facilitates formation of the NADP bound dimer. And so this NADP is a cofactor that the enzyme uses to perform the catalysis. <clears throat> And this arginine residue forms a salt bridge with an aspartate. So this mechanism is similar. When the arginine is mutated to a histidine, this salt bridge can only be formed uh, favorably at low pH when the histidine is protonated. At high pH, this would not have a favorable interaction. And so we uh, decided to test this hypothesis by forming heterodimer and measuring the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate from the heterodimer. And what we found is that the wild type, again, formed very low levels of 2-hydroxyglutarate, almost unmeasurable on, on this uh, assay. The mutant formed high and pH independent uh, production of the 2-hydroxyglutarate. But when we formed the heterodimer, we were able to reveal this distinct pH sensitive production, where when we have the wild type R132His heterodimer, you see distinct pH sensitive production with higher production at low pH. And so what this suggests is that the heterodimer is required for the pH dependent production of the 2-hydroxyglutarate. It's just in cells that heterodimer formation was... Um, uh, was not something that we generated, but something that the cells generated as the endogenous protein interacted with the mutant we were expressing. We further confirmed that heterodimer formation is pH sensitive by doing an ELISA assay where we bind the mutant protein or we bind the wild type protein to an ELISA plate and then titrate in increasing amounts of the mutant protein. And what we found is this distinct pH dependent trend where there's more binding, more heterodimer formation at low pH compared to high pH. And so all of this is to say is that there's a ton of work that goes in even when the pH sensing mechanism is known. We had measured years before this final paper was published, we had measured this pH dependent production inside cells, but it took us a long time to uh, isolate mechanism. <clears throat> and so what we found is that at low pH, when the histidine is protonated, you have favorable formation of the heterodimer and higher production of D2-hydroxyglutarate. Whereas at high pH, when the histidine is deprotonated, you don't get stable formation of the heterodimer, and thus you produce lower amounts of the D2-hydroxyglutarate. And so again, this is a ton of work, even when the behavior and protein activity is known from the start. We uh, started with that observation that the mutant protein produced pH dependent um, uh, product inside cells, <clears throat> but it took us a long time to trace down mechanism. And we've done this for a lot of different histidine-based uh, pH sensors, uh, wild type and mutant. And so there's the IDH1 that I just described, which induces pH-dependent dimerization and substrate shuttling. I don't have time in my talk today to talk about how we proved that substrate shuttling was occurring specifically at low pH, but you can go through uh, our paper that was published a few years ago if you're interested. 
Um, we've also shown that other uh, highly recurrent arginine to histidine mutations can confer pH sensing to the mutant protein, including this P53, ARG273 his mutation, which confers pH dependent binding specificity to the P53 target genes. We've also shown a similar mechanism through this recurring arginine to histidine mutation in EGFR, where this specifically activates EGFR signaling pathway at the high pH of cancer cells, conferring pH-dependent allosteric. And then finally, we've uh, recently been exploring the role of pH in regulating uh, signaling protein and adhe adhesion junctions proteins, adherence junctions proteins beta-catenin, where we can see that protonation can affect the ability of uh, E3 ligase, a protein that's responsible for degrading misfolded or old protein inside cells, is modulated in this uh, pathway by the protonation state of a conserved histidine residue. Now, this is interesting because it not only requires protonation, deprotonation of the histidine for high beta tercet binding, it also requires phosphorylation. And so this got us thinking a little bit in more detail about how in certain signaling pathways, you could have protonation and phosphorylation working in conjunction to confer a pH dependent outcome. But all of these examples just tell us that there's essential kind of design principles. There could be essential design principles for protein pH sensing in terms of position of histidine residues uh, close to a functional domain, in terms of the modulation of al protein allosteric either intramolecularly or between binding proteins as we see with the IDH1 and the beta-catenin. And so our lab is really, was really interested in kind of exploring these in more detail and with a uh, higher throughput, right? It took us a long time to identify all of these mechanisms. But importantly, these mechanisms also show roles for pH in regulating metabolism and redox uh, chemistry inside cells, uh, transcription of cells, protein signaling, and proteostasis. And so a, a kind of broader question that leads into the second half of my talk is how are pH dynamics integrated with other signaling nodes? Is there the potential for pH to be modulating or functioning as a rheostat to modulate signaling uh, in response to pH dependent changes in normal cells? And how might that be uh, modulated or dysregulated at <clears throat> the dysregulated pH of cancer cells? And so uh, a lot of the examples that I've uh, been walking you through today uh, include histidine residues as the key mediator. And that's been a very good way for us to assess pH dependent protein function. But we have a lot of pH sensors, proteins with pH dependent activity that we can measure in vitro or in cells, but we've mutated every single histidine residue to an alanine and the protein is pH still pH sensitive. And so this tells us that by using histidines as the flag for whether something might be pH sensitive or not, we're actually missing a whole host of uh, pH sensitive proteins that might be regulated through different means, through non-histidine um, uh, molecular mechanisms. And so in histidine switches, it's fairly easy to confirm pH dependent activity because you can take the histidine residue, make it a, a mutation and abolish the pH sensitive activity. And so the uh, issue with these more complex networks of ionizable residues that could potentially titrate cooperatively with physiological changes in pH is that the, the mutation strategy now becomes much more complex. You don't know which members of this network might be most important for pH sensing and thus that you should target uh, through mutation to confirm the mechanism. And so we wanted to start exploring these more complex networks. And, and so we did that in a, in a couple of different ways. So first I'm gonna tell you what amino acids we think make up these complex networks and why we think they might be pH sensitive. So as I've told you, histidine is the only naturally occurring amino acid with a solution pKa that's near neutral. It has a solution pKa of 6.5. <clears throat> but histidine has a measured pKa in proteins that can range between 4.0 and 8.5, given the local protein environment. So that means that the way that the protein folds and how solvent exposed the histidine is matters for the measured pKa, the rate uh, at which that protein is titrating with changes in solvent pH. Um, it can modulate it quite significantly. 
And so when we look at the other potential titratable amino acids in proteins, these are things like glutamate, lysine, and aspartate. So all of these have R groups that can go from a protonated to a deprotonated form, and all of them have solution PKs that are well outside the physiological range. <clears throat> but it's been shown for all of these proteins under specific conditions, namely where these proteins are buried at the interface between a protein domain or in the center hydrophobic core of a protein, that these uh, residues can have up or downshifted PKAs into the physiological range. And so this has been uh, reported mostly in model proteins. So proteins where they're introducing a mutation and adding a glutamate in the hydrophobic core of a protein. So we wanted to kind of explore whether wild type proteins contained number one, aspartates, glutamates, and lysines that were clustered. And number two, ones that were buried enough that they could have these significantly upshifted or downshifted PKAs. And so the idea is that if you have an ionizable network where those residues are buried, protected from solvent, it's possible that you could potentially have this titrating in the physiological range. And so the first kind of class of proteins that we looked at that might have this kind of uh, ionizable network sensing is uh, a signaling protein, um, a signaling module called SH2, which stands for SARC homology uh, domain two. And these proteins, uh, these domains are really important for regulating kinases and phosphatases. So generally these SH2 domains, when they're tightly bound to the kinase or phosphatase, they have low activity. And when they're released, they have high activity. And so this is usually modulated by some signaling protein coming in and binding the SH2. But we were curious whether under basal conditions, there uh, might be some SH2 domain regulation that's conferred by pH. And so these are structurally conserved and they play a role in protein regulation. And we hypothesize that the, oops, sorry, this is animating in a little weird. We hypothesize that the charged residues at the SH2 domain interaction interface may be pH sensitive and that this might modulate pH sensitive release of the SH2 domains, uh, which would be conferred, oops, by pH sensing. So the idea is that pH can uh, convert these signaling proteins from an active form to an inactive form as it modulates the binding and interaction of these SH2 domains. And so uh, SH2 domains are very complex. These proteins are very large and we don't expect to be able to guess a priori which amino acids would have upshifted or downshifted PKAs. And so this is where we relied on kind of a computational approach where we use the structure of the protein to potentially screen for pH sensing nodes. And this was work done by Kabi Van Dyke, who's a biophysics uh, graduate student in my lab. And so what he did was he used a PKA prediction software called ProPKA. He used some data cleaning and analysis approaches that allows us to filter the data very easily. And through this workflow, we're able to identify networks of ionizable residues that may have upshifted PKAs. And so we have the PDB uh, structure input. This is just culled from the protein database, the database of structural data on these key signaling proteins that contain SH2 domains. And what Kabi does is he runs a quick structure repair and atom replacement. This is done primarily in the ProPKA software where the software fills in any missing amino acids, any missing um, uh, density from the X-ray crystal structure, and then assigns the protein titration states. So adds hydrogens that aren't visible in the original crystal structure, but we know uh, exist in the protein. And then what he does is allows the software to do an energy minimization and a calculation of the PKA of the protein, uh, of the specific amino acids given their local protein environment. And so he's able to assign charge and radius parameters and calculate the electrostatic uh, properties within this software. And then he does some local filtration of the data. And so he curates the electrostatic data with a simple filter. Uh, are they, uh, do they have upshifted PKAs? And so for histidine, we call that upshifted if uh, in more than 80% of the structures, the histidine has a PKA of above 7.0. For glutamate, lysine, and aspartate, we're a little more broad. We count that as upshifted if in over 80% of the structures, uh, the lysine, glutamate, and aspartate have a PKA calculated uh, predicted PKA between 6.8 and 8.0.
And then finally, um, he does another filtration for buried residues. So based on literature from model proteins and protein engineering approaches, we know that burying, protecting the amino acid from solvent is important for its activity. And so he visualized, uh, he could visualize the um, uh, networks on the protein. So he can identify where these nodes are structurally. And he can also visualize this on a 2D map. So I'll be showing you both the three-dimensional structure as well as the 2D map in the coming example. And so the first example we worked on was this protein called SHIP2. And we chose this protein for three reasons. First, we know it's a phosphatase that turns off signaling and that low activity is associated with tumor genesis. And so when SHIP2 is low or knocked down or has low expression, that's generally associated with tumor genesis. <clears throat> it's also been reported in the literature that this protein is pH sensitive with increased activity at 7.0, which we would see in a normal cell versus 7.5. And so that's shown here. This is a paper from the mid 90s. And what they showed is that when you look at the activity of the protein versus pH here, you can see that with the um, wild type protein, which is in these black squares, you have increased activity going from 5.0 to 7.0 and then decreased activity from 7.0 to 7.5. But importantly, that paper was unable to characterize the pH sensing mechanism. And we think that's because it has this complex network and it's not a single histidine switching. And so what Kabi did was he entered all of the structural data on SHIP2 into his pipeline and he was able to get these interactions. And so this is the SH2 domain here, and then this is the phosphatase domain. And so what you can see here is he's indicating the P shit residues with PKA shift in cyan and the interacting residues um, in magenta. And so we can also look at that in a two-dimensional map. And what he found is that glutamate 252 and histidine 116 both had upshifted PKAs compared to what you would expect uh, based on their solution PKA. The glutamate has a predicted PKA of 7.2. So this is extremely high given its solution PKA is just four and a half, while the histidine had a PKA of 6.8 which is slightly upshifted compared to the, the solution PKA. And so what Kabi did was <clears throat> he wanted to first confirm that SHIP2 uh, purified and, and tested in our lab had a similar uh, activity curve as what's been previously published. Then what he wanted to do was perform point mutations at these two particular predicted uh, residues, the glutamate 252 and the histidine 116 that were predicted to have upshifted PKAs into the physiological range. And so I'm gonna walk you through the titration data here. So you can see that this uh, titration range goes, as, goes from pH 6.1 to pH 8.0. And what we found is that when we start at 6.1, the activity is really low. And as we go to 6.4, it increases. And at 6.7, it peaks. And then we see between 6.7 and 8.0, this nice distinct titration down through the physiological range where at 6.7, it has the peak activity. And between 6.7 and 8.0, you have reduced activity. So that's kind of hard to see in these Michaelis-Menten plots. And so we can plot the PACAT values calculated from these exact same plots based on uh, pH uh, that the reaction was conducted at. Again, this is purified protein in a test tube. And we can see this distinct pH dependent curve, right? Virtually matching what was shown previously in the, in the literature. So that's great. But what do our actual mutations look like? And so Kabi did the first mutation. Oh, sorry. And from these KCAT curves, we can uh, calculate apparent PKAs. And so the wild type has an apparent PKA of 6.6 and another apparent PKA on this downward slope of 7.2. And so this really does suggest that two residues are responsible for this pH dependent curve. One that's titrating uh, in the 6.6 to 6.8 range and one that's titrating in the 7.2 or higher range. And so when we look at the individual point mutations, I want, uh, I want you to realize a couple of things. One is that these point mutations, as you go from 8.0 again to 6.1 or 6.1 to 8.0, uh, do still have some pH sensitivity. So, but you can see that there's generally a highly active form that happens below 7.0 and then a lowly active form that happens above 
And so for this ship to uh, glutamate mutant, it still seems to be pH sensitive, but it has a shifted pKa. We look at the histidine uh, to alanine mutation. Again, this is mutating the titratable histidine to a non-titratable alanine residue, and we see a similar effect. And in this case, as we go from 6.1 to 7, <clears throat> excuse me, to 8.0, you can see that there's generally high activity up until about 7.4, and then generally low activity above that. And so we can similarly plot those for better ease of understanding on our KCAT curves. And what we see is that when we mutate the glutamate to an alanine, we no longer see this double titration. This protein that has a single pKa and that single pKa <clears throat> is occurring at about 6.8. So if we go over to the predicted PKAs, if we mutate the glutamate, the only amino acid that can still titrate in the physiological range is potentially this histidine, which has a PKA of 6.8. And that's approximately the PKA that we get from backfitting this KCAT curve. And so what this really does suggest is that our predicted PKA is very close, of that histidine is very close to, to what we see in these data. <clears throat> and then finally, when we do the exact same thing on the uh, histidine to alanine mutant, again, if we mutate the histidine, only the glutamate will titrate. The glutamate has a higher predicted pKa, and you can see that shift of the pKa uh, curve here and a higher pH sensitive uh, uh, pKa calculated. Now, the big goal here though, is to find a mechanism under which the protein is no longer pH sensitive. And Kabi did a double mutation where he mutated both the glutamate and the histidine residue. And what he found was beautiful pH insensitive activity across the phys entire physiological range. There's no difference in the uh, KCAT for this protein. And again, <clears throat> this suggests that the two titrations that we're seeing in the wild type curve are being driven by the glutamate and the histidine, because if you mutate both of those to non-titratable alanine residues, you see flat pH sensitive, uh, flat pH insensitive uh, pKa's. And so in the remaining time, uh, I hope that I can uh, just cover one more thing. I know I'm very short on time, but I just wanted to cover one more thing because the kind of goal of this work was to be able to screen more rapidly without even picking up a pipette for these pH sensitive proteins. Um, oops. Sorry, I forgot I added this. This is very new, hot off the presses data. So what we were curious about was whether we could have um, uh, uh, measure the change in protein structure as a function of pH. Again, we know when the SH2 domain is released, the protein is active, and when it's bound, it's inactive. And so here I'm showing uh, the N terminus of the SH2 in red and the C terminus of the SH2 in blue. Whoops, how do I go back to... Oh, it's not playing. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So this is molecular dynamics at a constant pH. So we're looking at the dynamics of the protein at pH 8.0. And as you can see here, there's not much movement. The SH2 domains stay pretty closely bound to the kinase or the phosphatase domain, which is in gray. And at pH 7.5, we see pretty much the same thing, maybe a little bit more flexibility, maybe a little bit more relaxation. But when we get to 6.5, we start to see this dynamic release of the SH2 domains. And so when we're pinning pH low, these domains no longer have a high affinity for one another. And over the course of the simulation, they're moving further apart. And we also went to a very low pH just to kind of confirm that this was a temporary uh, release of that domain. And when we do the simulations at pH 5, we see a locked down structure that looks identical to what we saw at pH 8. And so the kind of suggestion here is that these uh, proteins may sense small changes in pH and that the titration of these cooperative networks is allowing the dom SH2 domain to either be released or bound uh, depending on the physiological pH inside cells. So we're trying to confirm some of this through NMR and cryo-EM approaches. And uh, I'm gonna skip through these last bits and just tell you that we've been able to use this approach to identify ionizable networks in a whole host of signaling proteins. And what we found is that in SH2 domain containing proteins that have uh, yellow is SH2 domain and then uh, white kinase or phosphate domain, 
really do see this distinct clustering of ionizable networks at these interfaces. This is true across, across all of the domains. And so um, with that, I'd like to remind you that our goal is to understand pH dependent functions across biological scales to make biology and cancer more druggable, more detectable and, and more predictable. And um, we're, uh, I've been able to show you today that we've been able to identify histidine based wild type and mutant pH sensitive proteins. We've identified a computational route to screen for these uh, without even picking up a pipette. And we can use these networks to guide biochemical and cell biological characterization of pH sensitive proteins. <clears throat> and we validated that the hits from SHIP2 correctly identified the pH sensitive nodes of that protein. We've fully characterized its pH sensitive mechanism in uh, vitro. And we have uh, some data that we're still working on and to confirm that in cells. And these networks seem to be evolutionarily conserved across a lot of signaling proteins. And so you can imagine using similar routes to uh, identify design principles of pH sensitive proteins or molecular mechanisms for, for those uh, pH sensitive behaviors where, where no known uh, molecular mechanism is, is identified. And so we're developing a machine learning pipeline for faster characterization through that in silico approach. And we're validating more of our signal protein hits in vitro and in cells. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. I'd like to thank the funding sources that supported the work and particular Kabi and his uh, host of undergraduate researchers that have contributed to, to the main project that I talked about. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Professor Murray, would you want to begin commentary oh. questions? Yes, I just thank you again for sharing mm -hmm. this work. It's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> I, 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 I'm having a, well, I, I, I don't know, should I open the floor to questions uh, from the audience in the, in the uh, amphitheater live or should we start online? We could start online. You, uh, either you or myself could ask questions. Um, people could put questions into the chat. As yeah, well. I'm happy to. I'm happy to answer yes. questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay, I I have a question. Maybe mm -hmm. um, it's, this is all new to me. A lot of mm -hmm. it. Is, um, so maybe my question might not be right on key on on point. But I I got. I'm trying to. I'm having difficulty conceptualizing the protonation effect on the DNA and how that yeah. could lead to mutations that would change the residues in the protein? Yeah, so this is a this is a great question. So our our thoughts on pH as a driver of a genetic or mutation signature in cancer could could be related to a couple of different things. So um, if I go back hmm. This is going to take me forever. So it could be what you just described. It could be that protonation changes of the DNA could affect DNA structure and thus the ability of a repair enzyme to appropriately repair it or a repair enzyme to even recognize it. But it's also possible that the protonation is not happening on the DNA, but happening on the protein that does the recognition. And so we find that a lot of proteins require um, arginine residues to coordinate the negatively charged phosphate backbone of DNA. And one clear example we have of a mutation that affects the ability of a, a cancer associated mutation that affects the ability of an enzyme uh, or of a transcription factor to recognize its DNA is this P53 arginine 273 His. The arginine normally coordinates with the negatively charged phosphate backbone. It's really essential for its activity and its ability for the, this tumor suppressor to bind DNA and activate tumor suppressive function. So at low pH in a normal cell, this mutation, this arginine 273 His mutation is still able to bind DNA. It's still able to induce uh, death in response to double strand breaks. And it has virtually no uh, survival benefit to the cell. But if you raise the pH of a normal cell, now suddenly this histidine is no longer able to be protonated, the cell is no longer able to die, and it does not die after you induce double strand breaks. And so in this way, an initial mutation, the 273 His mutation, now becomes beneficial to a cancer cell, 
because it can survive and proliferate and grow even when there's DNA damage, even when there's mutation, even when there's this genomic instability that gives rise to all of these um, bad outcomes in cancer. So we don't think necessarily that these mutations are directly causing cancer. We think that they're providing a fitness advantage in the specific environment of cancer at that high pH. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an important distinction. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to put um, my biochemist on the spot. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. There's one in the chat I could answer if there's... Oh. You can hear me. I'm, I'm actually live here. Yeah. Uh, can you... Um, within the cell, uh, is there a re are there different regions within the cell that have different pHs that mm. are significant and are related to like the active metabolic sites like mitochondria and so on. Yes. Uh, how does that affect uh, the different pHs within the cell? How does that yeah. affect? Yeah, this is a this is a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of our beautiful microscopy images, but you can see in this example where you have this. I don't know if you, can you guys still see my pointer. Yes, uh, you can see uh -huh. this this beautiful protrusion of a of a piece of a cell protruding into the three dimensional extracellular environment that this this tumor model is growing in, and we frequently see that in these long protrusions, they have a higher pH than the rest of the cell. That might indicate more metabolic activity, that might indicate more ability to specifically degrade the extracellular matrix that requires acidification of the extracellular environment, which is frequently caused by taking protons inside the cell and pumping them outside the cell. And so that's just one example in a cancer model where we think there might be spatial and temporal differences in pH in these long protrusions or in these highly protrusive cells versus non-highly protrusive cells. The other case that we've seen, and you can see it in this model over here, is that when we induce cells to start migrating, there are measurable gradients of pH, where at the leading edge, you have a higher pH than in the trailing edge of the cell. You also have in those cases, mitochondria are excluded from the leading edge, and that's driven mostly by glycolytic enzymes generating ATP locally to produce uh, higher uh, to produce that uh, ATP that's required to induce protrusive phenotypes. And so as part of another project where we have a preprint out, uh, if you're interested, we've shown that high pH can upregulate the expression of glycolytic enzymes. And we have also recently shown that high pH can induce a change in localization of glycolytic enzymes to the leading edge. So it could be that pH is a driver of localized metabolon production. And it could also be that that localized metabolon production is reinforcing the pH. And so that's something that we're, we're trying to explore in a couple, of, a couple of different ways, but yeah, great question. Okay, let's take a question from the chat. I, are you seeing it? I know you talked about having mm -hmm. purified protein in a test tube. Would it be possible to isolate an energy ATP in a solution or consumable? Uh, yeah, um, maybe I'm not sure I understand this question, but there's there's a couple of different um, kind of components here. So when when the enzyme requires ATP, we we provide it in the test tube. There's also a potential question for how can you make a test tube more physiologically relevant. There are a lot of things in a, in a cell that you can't replicate in a test tube. And so one thing that we've done is we recently developed an approach that allows us to use optical light microscopy to raise pH in a single cell and leave its neighbors unaffected. And so in that way, we can create a test tube where we have a single cell, where we raise pH in a single cell, all of its neighbors in the same field of view are unaffected. And we could look at how that cell behaves compared to its neighbors. And so that provides us a really good control for how pH might be conferring some changes in biology. At the molecular scale, it's even harder. So uh, in order to replicate all of the cellular milieu that a cancer, that a, um, that a normal cell has with changes in pH, it's very tricky to do that in a test tube. So we also do experiments where we perform reactions with whole cell lysates, where we take all of the stuff that's inside of a cell at high pH and all of the stuff that's inside of a cell at low pH and put our purified protein in it to see how that changes its activity. But yeah, it's very tricky. So. Okay. We've kind of lost our 
in person audience. Yes. But okay. I, <laughs> I I do have one last question that yep. we see often sometimes online and stuff. What are your thoughts about um, alkaline water? <laughs> yes, this is a great yes. question. Yeah, yes. should I should I be drinking pH nine water? Um, <laughs> I would say no. <laughs> so the thing with uh, alkaline water is that it hits your stomach, which is a pH of two in all of your stomach acids, and so by the you'd have to drink like four or five liters an hour <laughs> in order to sustain a, a measurable change in your stomach acidity. But there's one thing that you can do if you're interested in kind of controlling the pH of your normal cells and like keeping them nice. And that's exercise, oxygenate your tissues, uh, because our cells primarily use bicarbonate from the air we breathe that's generated and provided to our tissues <laughs> in order to survive. But alkaline water, every time we publish something, people retweet me with alkaline water, but yeah. <laughs> but to piggyback on this alkaline water, based on the, the, the first few slides that you showed, it seems like the alkaline water is not beneficial, even if it right. could. Even if it could, right, it's yes, much, yes, even right? if it could, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. Yeah, so it's not so there's yeah, the, the alkaline water kind of comes from a couple for cancer treatment comes from a couple different things. So in cancer, the intracellular pH is high, but the extracellular pH as the tumor grows acidifies. And so the extracellular pH gets really low. And so the thought is that the high intracellular pH and low extracellular pH work together to contribute to some of these phenotypes, right? And it's been shown that if you acidify the extracellular environment, you can activate metallomatrix proteases that break down matrix and lead to migration and invasion, but you don't get the migration invasion unless you have high intracellular pH. So they do seem to work together in a lot of ways. And one might be sufficient in some cases and one might be insufficient in the other. But yeah, based on our model, you actually don't want your pH to be high. And a lot of people have used pH lowering drugs as a potential cancer therapeutic. So this has been studied with amelioride analogs since the mid 2000s. Hmm. And the problem is, is that when those are provided systemically, it induces a lot of heart damage and kidney damage. And so you need to find a way to better stratify patients to identify patients that might respond well to pH lowering drugs. Yeah. Okay. Just curious about yeah. <laughs> the, the many claims out there about the benefits. Yes, so there are. Yep. And we uh yeah, we always get we always get retweeted on that. And then also people who say you should uh drink lemons every or drink lemon water every day too. So there's yeah. alkaline water and then there's lemon water. Two yeah. boring, boring yeah. groups. Yeah. All, <laughs> All right. right. Thank so well, we want to thank you. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Thank for you for your presentation, and we look forward to hearing more about your research. Thank you. <laughs> okay, take care. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.